All right, welcome, Alex, my good friend from uh, many years ago. My best friend that I have met in, among the ones I have met in decades. <laughs> as, as, as a famous statistician once said, you're my best friend and I hate you. <laughs> well, we're not even that close. I mean, you, can't, you, can't, you can't hate me because we don't see each other often enough. <laughs> but uh, thanks for joining. And uh, uh, Alex, could you uh, let's say, introduce yourself? Sure, sure. First of all, it is such an honor to be chatting with you and so excited to see what how the program has evolved and, and just watching it over the past few years. So congratulations to you, to the team, to the entrepreneurs uh, that are just doing amazing work. Uh, so it's so exciting to see that. So briefly, Alex Manala um, have spent, uh, you know, lived just outside of Orlando, Florida, grew up in Chicago, um, from a career perspective, well, let me back up. From an academics perspective, PhD in math and econ, uh, quantitative economics is my academic background. So, David, as you well know, I used to be that guy they didn't let out of the back office. I am uh, certainly not in front of board members, uh, certainly in the late 90s and the early 2000s. Um, but uh, helped uh, at a firm called Diamond Management and Technology, David, where you and I were asked to launch our analytics practice. Lived in India for a bit of time to help grow that. Um, then went to, um, we were acquired by a firm called PwC, um, and at PwC, I helped build an, our analytics practice in India and then built it and launched it in Mexico and in Colombia as well. Shortly thereafter, um, I became a chief analytics officer at an oil and gas technology company. Uh, they were seeing on about 20 years of data, and if you, SCADA companies are the ones that put the alarms on all the artificial lifts uh, that bring oil, gas, and water to the surface. So I built them a analytics and a software as a service and a platform as a service model, uh, building models and, and launching them in Azure uh, to serve uh, our customers. Shortly thereafter, I became a managing director uh, at Accenture, where uh, I was our North American data-led transformation lead. That and $3 gets you a cup of coffee. So in, in short, um, it really is, you know, organizations throughout the world are really struggling with you know, as they move to the cloud and as they live in a healthy way in the cloud, um, how do you combine things like artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, along with healthy data pipelines uh, and doing that at scale to deploy models and data at scale. Um, my current role at Deloitte, um, I, a, I sit within our AI and data engineering practice. And again, I find myself right in the sweet spot between our strategy and AI and data engineering group, um, where a lot of my work these days is really focused on helping enterprises rethink their data and analytics operating models and really bringing that to the board and the C-suite um, as they think about investing uh, in data as a product, analytics as a product within their organization, um, because this has really become a C-suite problem um, it's no longer in mid-level management because the cost of data, while it's easy to move it, continues to increase at a rate that, that's beyond Moore's law, right? It is just exponentially oh, yeah. increasing because of all of the cloud and multi-cloud and hybrid solutions that are out there along with all the different tools. So that hasn't been solved yet. And so I spent a lot of my time, time these days helping clients with that. Amazing, amazing. I'm, I'm really, really excited to hear how uh, things have changed with respect to data and how your career has changed also. I mean, not that you guys, you were, I don't think you were in the back room. I thought what you're doing was fantastic, was, uh, you know, very interesting. You could work, by the way, crazy hours at that, uh, you know, when we used to work together, like seven days straight, you could work. I was always amazed. You had incredible health. Are you still that healthy these days? I mean, do you think, can, no, you, can you still yeah. work like? Yeah, I still, I, still, I still work like crazy, you know, um, but I have the sincere pleasure that on a Friday, I say to myself, I wish there was more days in the week um, <laughs> because I have the privilege to be spending time in the C-suite helping to solve some of our clients' most difficult problems that at one point for the past six to eight years or six to 10 years, really sat in middle management, but have now really become C-suite and board issues. And to be able to sit at those levels and shape how organizations are thinking about how they, they look at their teams and operate and report out to the street um, is incredibly compelling and exciting. So 
I feel very, very fortunate and blessed to have these opportunities. So yeah, excited, but I'm in good shape. Still run marathons and half marathons. <laughs> oh my God. Um, getting ready. My yeah. next one is going to be in Nashville. So uh, once I get over this little cold, uh, I'm going to get back to training and um, all good stuff. Amazing. I, I tell my students, by the way, you got to also be healthy to be successful. So well, and health, health, by the way, is something I deal with, with, you know, folks I work with. It's not just physical health, it's emotional and, 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 and mental health. Um, and I try to make sure that saying, hey, you know, you have to take time for you. Uh, and you have to make sure you reward yourself before you reward anyone else around you. So it's super important. Amazing. So you talk to CEOs, you talk to leaders of businesses. What kind of uh, teams do you have, by the way? What kind of team members do you have on your team? Do you have a lot of uh, math, statistics guys, programmers? Yeah. What kind of people do you have? It's, it, I would really say, uh, David, this is, you, you'll, you'll, you'll remember this, multidisciplinary teams. <laughs> clients, yeah. Most clients nowadays do mm -hmm. not want teams with just quants on them. Mm -hmm. Most teams nowadays don't just want pure strategy. They want applied strategy. Mm -hmm. um, most teams don't just want, um, you know, a, a finance person on it. Quite frankly, most of our clients, again, when you're working in the C-suite, I can't just talk about a confusion matrix because their client's going to become confused. I can't just talk about uh, EBITDA and free cash flow because unless you can back that up, it, it doesn't mean a whole lot. Uh, mm -hmm. And I can't just talk about high level strategy because clients no longer have the appetite to say, let's do strategy. Now let's think about what's next. And yeah. that dynamic in, 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 in the marketplace and the demands from our customers are palpable. So most of my teams are made up of this multi, multi skilled teams that are, are, are smaller in nature, but bring this cross section of where I'm at now at Deloitte to the table to both think about the strategy as well as how we think about the quantitative, the data, the deploying of it, and then the value part. Amazing, amazing. So uh, this is an interview for our uh, Center for International Business. Um, to what extent do you do business um, internationally? You probably have clients of international businesses. You might have clients who are from abroad. What, what kind of uh, things do you do that are uh, that's international? Yes. So. <clears throat> Two, two clients I'm currently working with, while, albeit they are headquartered in Chicago, um, they, are, they are very large international, one's a very large international technology reseller uh, organization, and another one is essentially a, an organization that certifies uh, electronics and algorithms, a uh, very, very well-known uh, uh, company. And, and as they think about their strategy and going forward, there's three specific areas that they're, that they're looking at. One, um, how do they think about data monetization? Huge opportunity. So many of these clients that are sitting on trap value within their, the, 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 the corpus of information um, that they've been sitting on for years and how to rethink how they use that to serve up better products, how to serve their customers better, um, and how to acquire new customers. And while that sounds a little bit like motherhood and apple pie, you have to keep in mind that the explosion of data has really caused a lot of movement of, of what I call data icebergs. Um, and so there's this clashing that happens, um, as you can think about, from a, a data perspective, an analytics perspective, and an insights perspective. So that, that's part one, data monetization. Part two, every single one of my clients, and the call I was on just before this with our client is all around, how do we rethink our operating model and how we work together and how we consume data, how we create self-service models, and how we draw it, drive down total cost of ownership. So that's part two. Part three, every single one of my clients, and this is a new role that I actually took on at the firm, are all looking at how you think about uh, environmental sustainability and governance, so ESG. So, you know, when you think about whether it's processing algorithms, your carbon footprint, or reducing your carbon footprint, carbon trading, every single, this is a major board and C-suite initiative. However, many, many of our clients don't even know how to fully define it, you know, and, and, and so it's really thinking through what those strategies look like, how you think about differences between a physical risk and a transition risk, i.e. legislation, uh, and everything in between. So the areas that I'm focused on these days are really those three tranches of work that keep me very busy and super excited. Well, the, uh, I think you answered much of the uh, next question, which is uh, one of the 
meats of this interview is um, so what do global what do companies need to do to be you know more globally competitive these days right is it maybe doing those things you mentioned they they, they absolutely are um, however <clears throat> a couple of things um, there's not a single day that you don't open the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the, whatever, that you see uh, issues with data integrity, data breaches, uh, and, 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 and customer privacy. Um, you know, as, as remember I talked about data monetization a few, a few seconds ago, um, as we think about data monetization, it's both on the consumer side, uh, as, as, as you and me side, as well as, as, as you think about uh, the, 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 our client side and the enterprise side. Our data is uh, our data. Our personal data is currency. It, it really is. So, how are enterprises, global enterprises, going to get you to be able to share and want to share? Self selection bias is the most powerful bias that we all can ever achieve, right? So, what kind of level of intimacy can I achieve with you that actually gets you to want to have? a greater intimate relationship with me. Look at the conundrum Southwest Airlines is in right now. How many people are gonna choose to share information with Southwest given what's happened to them over the past few weeks, right? It's a very prolific case. Don't be, I guarantee you there'll be an HBR article coming out around that about that. Um, also, you think, so, so being able to achieve a level of customer intimacy at a global level using both the, the PII information appropriately, but how you think about synthetic information, because as human beings, uh, we all behave in similar ways. As a good psychologist says, you're unique, but your problems are not. So how do I think about that ecosystem across a global enterprise to achieve a, a greater intimacy with my, with my customers, whether it be B2B or B2C, um, and do that in a way that gains trust with them, gains market share with them, and helps you think through other ways you can monetize that type of information. You're on, you're on mute, Mr. David. Oh, I thought I'd be better than this on Zoom, but, uh, <laughs> but okay, J just to finish up on that, is there like a company uh, that you know that's doing a pretty good job versus others on, on what you just mentioned? Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, so- Some public information. Yeah. 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 All, all public information, yeah. of of course. So when I think about, you take a look at like what 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 Google is doing. I think Google's doing a a, a, a pretty pretty good job there. You know, mm -hmm. overall, like mm -hmm. and 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 knowing that that organization very well doesn't mean they're perfect everywhere. Mm -hmm. But they have very good strategies mm -hmm. on where they want to be spiky. Uh, based upon what I just talked about. So it doesn't mean they want to be the best across all domains, right, but where right. do they want to be spiking? How are they investing? That, that's really important. It doesn't mean they have to be Googly everywhere. Right. Uh, the brand does, but it doesn't mean that from a data and an investment and customer what, perspective. What makes right? sense. Yeah. Um, and then on the on the other side of that, um, you, let's take let's take a look at, at, at like a TikTok, for example. Mm -hmm. and take a look at the challenges that a TikTok has faced, right? Mm -hmm. So the sharing of information, that personal information, right? Mm -hmm. How do you how do you create transparency in the mm -hmm. data that's being collected and shared, mm -hmm. such that both from a legislative perspective, all the way down to the consumer perspective, right? You're not right. fighting that, right? They, the 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 former he was going to be a potential CEO of Disney, then he came over and he was a he was CEO of TikTok for a little while. And then some of that legislation kind of kicked in a couple of, about two years ago and he left and now there's a new CEO. Yeah. These, were the these are the challenges they're facing, right? This is the mm -hmm. challenges they're facing as they think about the consumer sharing of information, how that information is used, where it's used, and being transparent, having ethics behind your AI, ML, your data pipelines mm -hmm. is absolutely paramount for global enterprises these days. A lot of other things too, but yeah. when you think about the backbone of every single problem an entrepreneur is gonna to have to face, they're mm -hmm. gonna ask, what type of data do you have? How mm -hmm. does it represent your organization? How do I ensure that I can analyze it in an ethical way such that I can shape corporate strategies? Right, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, you, can't, you can't have a policy inside a company where let's just abuse these, our customer data, right? And then have, have a, have a functioning and uh, organization that employs, uh, you know, trust the organization to want to go, go to work there. Yes. So, 
you know, there's there's a saying in IT and IT SecOps called security by design, right? <laughs> and, and while it's a little bit of an old saying, it does get glossed over every once in a while because um, when the world we live in today around AI and, and, and ML and even uh, uh, the recent chatbot that's out there where people are going out there now, right? Chat GP from... Chat from GP. Yeah. yeah, right. People are saying, tell me a story about a sunrise and it writes a soliloquy on how perfect that is. Right. Yeah. Um, the point being is that is that information, how it's used, the privacy therein. Um, it's an amazing opportunity that enter global enterprises have right now to take a step back and rethink about how to not create moral hazards inside your organization around how data is used and consumed. But mm -hmm. more importantly, being transparent with that, you know, with your customer base to say exactly what it looks like so they understand it in layman's terms, right? Anyone could read this, you know, the pages and pages yeah. of stuff we click on for a credit card application or if we're signing up for Facebook or LinkedIn and how you're, but does anyone know that if a company goes, you know, bankrupt and, or there's an M&A activity, how is your information protected? Right. Those are really key pieces to the story and things that as consumers we should be asking ourselves and as global enterprises, they should be helping to answer. I had la one last question that's happened. Oh, boy. Okay, can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay, all right. La last question. Um, so, um, you know, this we are an education institution and, uh, you know, we support our students and uh, other young professionals. Uh, what advice would you have for... Uh, uh, you know, students and young professionals about how they can be, how can they prepare them, how can they prepare themselves for a, you know, globally competitive world and um, uh, prepare themselves to be globally competitive? Yeah, sure. First, you know, I, I think I have three, three, three points on that. First, first and foremost, um, be an advocate for, um, data, the information, and, and, and how it's used therein. Any entrepreneur is going to say, right, as they're evaluating an opportunity, mm -hmm. I'm going to need X, Y, and Z pieces of data. I want to evaluate. I want to evaluate how valuable an, a company could be. I want to be able to forecast. Um, be an advocate for that information, but also be protective of that information. I think any entrepreneur that's coming out today that could be a potential CEO, CFO, COO, CIO, whatever, right, that mindset is in the board today. It you wasn't know, always there. Well, that's very interesting because we, we, you know, especially being a Jesuit institution, we teach our students to be ethical about everything they do, but uh, we haven't really emphasized, you know, about data, right? To be that about data. So it's, that's it's so so important. Interesting. It's so important. It, 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 it's critical. I think that the, the second part is, if I if I was if I was there in the classroom, mm -hmm. I would ask the students to draw a triangle. And on the, le on the lower left-hand side, I'd say data scientists. Mm -hmm. At the top of it, I'd put a citizen data scientist. And on the mm -hmm. lower right-hand side, put uh, a business user. As mm -hmm. an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. you should be able to sit in the middle of that whole triangle and be able to function and communicate to each one of those folks. Because as an entrepreneur, you have to get leverage and you have to get leverage from the people around you. Otherwise, you cannot be a successful entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. And with the profiles that are shaping our world that we live in today, mm -hmm. successful entrepreneurs, no, think about Elon Musk for a second. Do you mm -hmm. think he, he's a rocket scientist? No, he's not. Um, <laughs> so think he makes it look like he is, yeah. Makes it look like he is. Yeah. He's, all, he's not also not a marketing genius, right? Yeah, yeah. So he surrounds himself in the middle with those people and he mobilizes those two. So to be a great entrepreneur in the world we're living in against the backdrop of the evolving data uh, hemisphere, I'd like to say, um, be figure out where you sit in that middle and how you augment your skills and your capabilities therein. Amazing. That's, part, that's part two. Yeah. Part three, to me, I think it has to get back to um, understand your brand. Because as an entrepreneur, your brand is reflected in everything that you do. It's your fingerprint on everything you do. So <laughs> think about your core brand identity, who you are, uh, what your beliefs are, um, how that reflects in the ethos of a company. 
in its values, mm -hmm. um, how you go about doing business with your customers, how you create value for yourselves, for the street, for things like Series A funding, they, all those types of things. As I tell all the folks that work for me, our clients buy people, not solutions. As an entrepreneur, people mm -hmm. are going to come to you because of your brand, your That's core right. brand and your extended brand identity. That's so right. if you think about the three things I said, if you flip them, Right now, you almost have a Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And now, if you think about that, <laughs> course, safety yeah. and security, yeah. right? Then, kind of, you know, that middle part where we're living and being, and at the top of it, really is that self realization of who you are and the fingerprint you're going to leave as an entrepreneur on the organizations you work with. I love it. I, I love everything you said. Uh, one last question about global competitiveness of the individual. What because you work with a lot of data, AI, does, uh, to what extent does everybody need to learn uh, something about it? Um, yeah, yeah. What, what, kind of, what kind of training should, I mean, obviously data science needs probably specific kind of training, entrepreneurs or, or anybody else. What kind of yeah, uh, yeah. education or training or information should they be able to uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, prepare themselves? So go back to that triangle I just drew. Right. And go back to the statement I just made a little earlier. As a good psychologist says, you're unique, but your problems are not. Mm -hmm. For all of your students, for you and I, David, in our career, we had to decide kind of where we sat in, mm -hmm. in, in the ecosystem of people we work with and, and who, who we are. Mm -hmm. um, so when you talk about training, first of all, understand what, where your, your strength is and where your passion is. Mm -hmm. So if it's a little bit more towards the data science side and you really like to understand that. Mm -hmm round out your skills i mean whether it's a coursera across there's moves all over the place or whether it's finding additional uh, classes right at, at, the, at, the, at the university there to, to to round out go do that yeah. right or um if you're more on the on a finance side and a financial engineering type side make sure you're rounding that out no matter what though no matter what be a great storyteller be a great <laughs> yeah. storyteller no uh -huh. matter what. And this is where I see entrepreneurs. This is where I see data science teams. Yes. This is where I see strategy teams fall down all the time. Uh -huh. They pull together really great insights, but they can't tell a story. If you're going to be an entrepreneur, if you're going to create value around all of this, and it's, and it's around that entire triangle storytelling. You could spell it around the triangle. Every single one of us have to be great storytellers to tell the story on how I'm getting from point A to B to C to Z. That's very interesting. So what you're saying is, first of all, you're saying not everybody has to be a super data scientist. No. You, know, but you, you gotta find sort of your 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 spot. Yep. And then if, if you do, you gotta be able to articulate who you are, basically. Yep. And what you and what what you see, what your vision of the of the world is, basically. That's what you're yep. saying. Perfect. Yep. Absolutely. And, and look, quite frankly, data science is going to be, it, it is becoming commoditized, right? It, it is going to be, it was one of those careers that went up and then it will come back. It's almost like a sine wave. It won't go to zero, but yeah. with things like automation and RPA and all those types of things that are out there, mm -hmm. the need for data science skills will eventually asymptotically approach zero. It won't go to zero, uh, but eventually it will get there. So mm -hmm. now you have to say, if I, if that's, if that's, you know, kind of the the forecast of that career. Not everyone needs to be a data scientist, but what I do need to be able to do is ask the right questions mm -hmm. like around ethics, around transparency into the model. About I always say, and I've been saying this for 22 years. There's statistical significance and practical significance. As mm -hmm. an entrepreneur, you draw yourself right in the middle of that Venn diagram. Entrepreneur, mm -hmm. I need to be able to be able to ask the right questions so that I can communicate properly to my shareholders, to my teams, and to the value of my enterprise. By the way, I think I think you did say that. Oh, yeah, I haven't <laughs> said it for a long time. I think I, I, think I remember hearing that from you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, look, I learned the hard way. My first project, I walked in, I, I, I talked about a variance covariance matrix, and I wasn't allowed to speak to uh, for another six months. <laughs> oh, awesome, awesome. Well, I don't want to take more of your time today. I want to take more of your time later, but... Uh, <sighs> Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you, and, and 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 to you, and of course your you know your students and anyone else 
Um, I'll always make myself available. Connect with me on LinkedIn for sure. Um, but I'm always here for you, David. You, we go back so many years, so I'm absolutely privileged and honored to have had this conversation, and I hope the students find it helpful. No, no, you've been a great friend. Although you know, we, again, we haven't been in, a lot, in touch a lot, but I uh, really enjoy uh, also connecting with you, talking to you. Let's do it more often. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you for doing this and. Uh, have a great day. I'll see you soon. See you soon. Thank you, yeah. David. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers.